Yeah, good to see you all. So as you can see, the lid's not on the baptismal. You know what that means, right? Yeah. So Layton's getting baptized today. Her dad gets the privilege of baptizing her, which is incredible and awesome. Um, so here, for those of you that don't know why this is in front of our stage every week, and those of you who, who we're just going to remind you every week, this is because we want to feel the weight that if somebody is not here celebrating a death to life baptism, that we are going to be upset about it, right? right? Right. And so what that means is we are praying every day for the lost people in our city, for the lost people that we interact with, and for the lost people. And what I mean lost, those who have not found hope in Jesus. That's what we mean by that, okay? So we say there's two groups of people sitting in this room, those who are following Jesus and those who are not yet following Jesus. Those who are not yet following Jesus, we desperately want you to find the hope of Jesus so we can celebrate, so all of heaven can celebrate, and you can finally stop pursuing the never-ending mess that will constantly put something in front of you that tells you this is it. And then when Jesus comes into that view and you find everything you've been searching for, your life can actually be at rest with peace. Amen, Christians? Yeah. This is why we want to celebrate this like crazy. So I heard Pastor Joel talking about his week. Um, my week has been absolutely, this has been one of the heaviest spiritual warfare weeks I've had in a long time. I, I, I feel like I live under a constant and continual spiritual warfare, but this week it, it manifested itself physically to me. And so literally, like, I, I do not take naps. I require little sleep. And yesterday, um, I woke up. My wife and I had a really great date night Friday night. Um, we, I had trained 10 church planters this week, great staff meeting on Thursday. And then Friday, I'm, I sit down to study, and my, my mind is literally blank. Like I, It's almost like I can't read, I can't think, and I can't process. And it was super frustrating to me because I'm like, I have these rhythms, and it was just like they were 100% thrown off this week. And so I'm like, okay. I know where you want me to go, Lord, but you're not letting me get there for some reason. So I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to be faithful. Saturday morning, I wake up early and I go and I sit for three hours in front of this computer with my Bible open praying, Lord, what do you want? Nothing. Sleep. Like we had a day planned yesterday and I literally fell asleep at my table at my computer like this. My wife and Tyler made fun of me. Not cool, right? Jeez. <laughs> and then we go eat lunch and we come back and I sit down on the couch and I immediately fall asleep. And they wake me up to eat dinner and I immediately fall asleep again. And I slept from after dinner all the way till five o'clock this morning where I got up and I sat here and I said, Lord, I am going to go preach in a few hours. <laughs> what do you want me to say? And he just started digging out the things that he'd already been putting inside of me for, I would say, years, but in specifically in response to what I've been praying for for years. And that is this whole piece of this Asbury revival and what do we do with this now? And so I want you guys to start to process and start to think. For those of you that don't know what that is, I'll show you this picture. This is a 1,600-seat building on the campus of Asbury University. It has been filled up for weeks upon weeks at this point, with predominantly young students crying out to the Lord and Him responding. It has become an actual global phenomenon. Some of my missionary friends around the world are saying, hey, what's going on with Asbury? Have you been there? Tell me about it. It's made global news. They have now stopped this. They've said, okay, we have to get back this is a campus. This is a college. We have students who need to be in classes. We need to resume somewhat of a normalcy because we want you to take this out to where you live. And it almost feels like, oh man, it's over. But see, this is where the work begins. How many of you, by not raising your hands, when you first saw your wife were so infatuated with butterflies and then you wake up next to her five years later and the feeling's not quite the same, don't raise your hand. <laughs> it's way better, right? Raise your hand. <laughs> 
Like there's just something with, we're, we're just infatuated with feeling and excitement and we're infatuated with newness and we're infatuated by these moves of God, moves of things. If anything's happening socially, we want to go be a part of it, right? And then when it's over, we just look for the next experience and we survey things. We want to be a part of it. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we want to see this continue, if we want to see this actually become something other than something that happened for hundreds of hours on a college campus, now the real work begins, church. And this is where we come in. Because today, the title is, God comes where he's wanted, and what is our response? So we're just going to ask that the Lord would bless our day today, and then we're going to jump right into this. <clears throat> God, we love you. We thank you for the ways that you are moving, not only globally, God, but now it seems here in our country. We have stood off from a distance for years and watched you do incredible things everywhere around the globe. Myself and so many others have been praying, God, why not here? Why not now? And it seems that you have started to answer this prayer. The worst thing we could do, Jesus, is to get caught up in all of the hype and not continue to carry this on. So, Father, I pray that our hearts are melted and molded towards your desire, not ours. They are moved so deeply by the Holy Spirit today that the rest of our life is dedicated and committed to seeing you come in our city. Jesus, we pray for this. We trust it. We lift it up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I have been absolutely intrigued by movements that have happened all over the world. There's, there's incredible things that take place when the Holy Spirit just falls on a place. Now, I, I have been using the word the Holy Spirit, um, and, I'm not, and I understand that probably not some of you know what that means. So let me give you just a little bit of a picture of this, okay? We follow what is called a Trinitarian God, okay? So this would be three parts in one God, all right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have time to unpack all of this theology, but since Joel brought up eggs, I'm going to use an egg. You ready? If I were to have a carton of eggs up here and pull it out, I would not say, here, take my three-part egg. But an egg is three parts. It is a hard shell. It's a white yolk. stuff. No, the yolk's yellow. It's white stuff. What is that called? So weird. I eat egg whites, right? That's what I eat. So then there's the white part of the egg, and then there's the yellow yolk. It's three parts. It's the same egg. We are not confused by that, except when we don't know what to call the white stuff. <laughs> so if I had this book, this is the Bible, I could say, hey, let me hand you my three-part book, because there is a cover, there's a binding, and then there's pages, but I don't hand you a three-part book. I just hand you my Bible, right? Now, it, it doesn't, this it seems like, well, yeah, why would you call that a three-part book? It's clearly one thing. Agreed. So is the Trinitarian God. So when we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it, it's hard for us to understand them equally living and reigning as God because they have three distinct parts. The Holy Spirit, so God the Father, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to bring salvation. He died the death we deserved and we were owed. He rose again from a grave, resurrecting, bringing salvation and putting sin and death to shame once and for all. And then as he ascended to heaven, he said, but I will send you a helper called the Holy Spirit. And that is what will reside inside of you. And so when I say Holy Spirit, that's what I mean. Everybody clear? Okay. Okay. Even if you're not, just say yes so we can move on. I'll explain later, okay? But I want you to understand what I'm talking about when I say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit, for those of you that are followers of Jesus, when you feel this prompting in your life to not do something or to do something, you don't know where it's coming from. It's not conscious. It's Holy Spirit. For those of you that are not yet following Jesus, when you feel a prompted towards things or to do or not to do those, that's conscience most of the time. Now, if you've been pursuing God, that could be the Holy Spirit drawing you to him. And that's a distinction that you'll have to make to see where you're at in your relationship with the Lord. 
But for those of you that have the Holy Spirit inside of you because you've surrendered your life in salvation, those promptings are the Holy Spirit moving you to do things or telling you, hey, don't do this. Okay? Now, I want to make clear that when you surrender your life, you have all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. For some of you with different theological backgrounds, you might disagree with me right now, and that's okay. We can talk later. The reason why this is so fresh and so strong is because they have experienced more of the Holy Spirit by stripping more of themselves away than they've ever experienced. Does that make sense? When I strip more of me, I get more of God. I'm not accustomed to that level of intimacy with God, so it seems like I'm getting more of him. He's just showing me more of him. Does that make sense? So the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of every one of you followers of Jesus right now. If you are not experiencing the power that you're seeing here and you desperately want it, listen to me really carefully. It's because you're holding on to too much of you. And if you want to see this happen and continue in our city you have to start letting go of you and you will see more of him and it will be a move unlike anything you've ever seen. I just want to make sure we're all clear before I move on. This is really, really important for you to understand because I think there's a big misconception that people are getting more of the Holy Spirit and you can word it that way if you want, but you have all of the Holy Spirit inside of you you're ever going to get in your salvation. So, with that being said, I've studied these revivals for years because I desperately want to see this in our church, my city, and my life, your city, and your life. So being at this university, I'm not really sure what to call it, an awakening, a revival, whatever time will tell what this will become, but there have been clear and evidenced revivals that have happened all over the globe. I want to tell you about one called the last one that has been marked that we know of called the Revival in the Hebrides. Now, we saw the Great Awakening in the 70s here in our country. Some incredible movements and churches started out of that. And those are absolutely amazing things that have been called awakenings and movements. But a revival that, that we talk about these movements across the world seem to be something a bit different. They're all sparked when people desperately seek the Lord and they don't let go until he responds. It's much like Jacob in the Bible. If you guys read that story of Jacob in the Bible, there was this, there's this exchange that happened where this angel of the Lord came down. And I don't mean the fluffy little fat thing you sit on your shelf. Not an angel, by the way. Okay, angels were warriors. <laughs> they would have looked like the frontline warrior to do battle, muscular, strong, ready to literally tear a lion apart with its own two hands. That kind of angel came down and interacted with Jacob. And Jacob wrestled with this angel all night because he wanted the angel to bless him. And as the sun starts to come up, the angel says, you have to let me go. And Jacob says, absolutely not. Not until you bless me. I'm not letting you go. Those are the kind of things that spark the revival that I'm about to tell you about. My question is, we, before we move on, is like, how badly do you want to see it? Because it's going to take something that you have never done before, church. And I can confidently say that because there's no revival happening here in our city. And I put myself in that same statement. Do any of you recognize the name Peggy and Christine Smith? Anybody? Probably not. But if your last name starts with F, S and you're standing behind them in heaven, you're going to be there a while. <laughs> as they throw crown after crown at Jesus' feet, because those two ladies, 184, 182, one of them blind, the other so badly stricken with arthritis that she couldn't even stand up straight, looked around their city and said, our churches are empty of young people, our bars are full of them. God, this is not okay. We need you to do something about it. And they did not let him go until he did. So these two ladies 
chose 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning to start praying and not letting God go until he moved. And so this starts to happen and things start to happen in the city. The Holy Spirit is moving in some incredible ways that people have never seen before. People are literally out plowing in fields, feel the presence of the Holy Spirit over them and just surrender their life to Jesus. It's happening in bars. It's happening in churches. It's happening everywhere because these two little old ladies have said, God, we are going to get a hold of you and we're not stopping until you move. Now, church, I don't know if that sounds weird to you. But probably the most prolific writer on prayer named E.M. Bound, e. Bounds says, our prayers can direct God. I want you to let that sit for just a second. Because for some of you theologians, that sounds sacrilegious to you and blasphemous to you. But think about it like this. I have three sons. I love my three sons so much that I will do nearly anything for them. And so when our hearts and our wills align and they ask me for something, I'm not going to stand back here and be like, I'm not going to help you. Why would I help you? Like my heart's going to be moved to help my sons accomplish what they're trying to do because our hearts are aligned. So their requests can move me towards them. Does that make sense? So does it seem that far-fetched that our prayers can actually move God? Do this. Nope, it doesn't seem that far-fetched. But now you probably felt a little bit of fear set in, didn't you? Like, oh my gosh, what kind of prayers are those? That's actually pretty simple. They're nothing special. It is you desiring to see God move at all cost to yourself. There's nothing special about your prayers. There's nothing special about my prayers. There's nothing special about Peggy and Christine Smith's prayers. They were just two very determined ladies who said, we are not letting you go, God, until you move. Peggy and Christine Smith had called for an evangelist called, named uh, Duncan Campbell. As they called him into their house, he's, he is the one writing this book that I've read several times. He said, as I walked into this house, I felt the presence of the Spirit so heavily, I almost fell down with the weight of it. Now, he's a traveling evangelist, very popular, very well liked. And they said, you need to go to this church in the Isle of the Hebrides. And he said, ladies, I'm not called there. God does not want me to do that. And I'm going to read you the quote of what they said. <laughs> they said, Mr. Campbell... If you were living as close to God as you should be, you would know that he's, that's where he's calling you to. <laughs> so he felt that their rebuke was from the Lord, and he went. They said, awaiting for you on that island is a church that's been empty for years that will be filled with people waiting for you to speak to them. As he pulls onto the island, it's not only full, but there are people, literally multiple people deep all the way around that church waiting to hear the gospel. What happened in the midst of that was a young kid named Donald, a 15-year-old boy. This is what excites me so much about this story, is he used an 84-year-old and an 82-year-old with if you look at society, we have pretty much disregarded anyone that age of anything of importance. You come to the full other side, and a 15-year-old knows nothing about anything according to society. And God's like, well, I think I'm going to use both of those groups of people. And this is what I love about it. How many of you are super special and important in this room, and not just because your mom said so? I mean, I'm not. This is a room full of ordinary people. Would you agree? Like, there's no royalty in here that we know about, right? If you are, your tithe does not reflect that. <laughs> I, I see a room full of ordinary people, which excites me even more. Because what would happen if we started praying and expecting God to move, and he did, and he couldn't, it couldn't be traced back to any extraordinary person? 
That's what God does in these movements. I want to read you a few stories that this 15-year-old boy Donald was responsible for. As Duncan Campbell heard about him, he went to his home, and one day he found him on his knees in the barn with a Bible open before him, and he said, excuse me, Donald. When he interrupted quietly, Donald said, excuse me a little, Mr. Campbell, I'm having an audience with the king. In the police station they went to after that in Barvis, he stood up one night, simply clasped his hands together, and uttered one word, Father. Everyone was melted to tears as the presence of God invaded that jailhouse. Now, this one has a little bit more explanation behind it, but the most outstanding example of God's anointing upon this young man was in Bernera, a small island off the coast of Lewis. Duncan was assisting at a communion service. The atmosphere was heavy and preaching difficult. So he sent to Barvis for some of the men to come and assist in prayer. They prayed, but the spiritual bondage persisted. So much that halfway through his address, Duncan stopped preaching. Just then, he noticed this boy Donald visibly moved under deep burden for the souls. He thought, this boy is in touch with God and living nearer to the Savior than I am. So leaning over the pulpit, he said, Donald, will you lead us in prayer? The boy rose to his feet and in prayer made reference to the fourth chapter of Revelation, which he'd been reading that morning. Oh God, I seem to be gazing through the open door. I see the lamb in the midst of the throne with the keys of death and hell at his girdle. He began to sob, lifting his eyes toward heaven and cried, Oh God, there's power there. Let it loose. And with the force of a hurricane, the Spirit of God swept into the building and the floodgates of heaven opened. The church resembled a battlefield. On one side, many were prostrated over the seats, weeping and sighing. And on the other side, some were affected by throwing their arms in the air in a rigid posture. God had come. Is that incredible? Like, how would we respond if that happened right here, especially led by one of our 15-year-old students? So what is my point in all of this? The biggest thing that we seem to struggle with today is not just our identity, but our willingness to be used by God. Every single person in this room that has struggled with sin, you at some level do not think that you can be used like this for God. The enemy continues to lie to us and we believe it because he says, yes, your sins are forgiven, but people don't know what you're doing right now. Yes, your sins are forgiven and you may have it together now, but nobody knows about your past. Yeah, okay, the story's cool and all, 15-year-old boy. He hasn't really done anything with his life. What does he have to be ashamed of? Oh, those two older ladies, 82 and 84, well, they probably, you know, had horrible lives and they made up for it, and now God can use them later on. But wherever you're sitting, what lie are you believing? That's the most important part of this. I'll tell you what mine is. The church that I grew up in, as well-intentioned as it was, just pounded perfection. Like I was supposed to arrive at the level of Jesus one day. Now, this church did not intend to breed legalism in me, but it's exactly what it did. So it's really, really hard for me in my moments of weakness, when I'm listening to the enemy to believe that he truly forgives me of everything, that he could really use me and my prayers for the Holy Spirit to fall on this place. And then I, it's always met with, yeah, but. Yeah, but God, you saw what I did yesterday. You saw what I'm thinking right now. How can you use that? And this is what it is for me. When I met with the holiness of God to know and understand, hey, I can and I want to use you, but you have to let you go. This is what I just keep running up against for me. I don't know what it is for you. 
But I want to show you a picture that I think describes our society and my life. Up there at the top, I see myself when I was 25 and surrendered my life to Jesus. And I was willing to take that pickaxe and break through anything and everything that needed to be broken through for the sake of the gospel to be shown to people. Now, I'm not the guy at the bottom. That's not me. But it can become me real easy. We live in a microwave society, church. A lot of what I watch today, one swing with that pickaxe and we don't find diamonds, we turn around and leave. (laughs) Because we want everything right now. And this is the danger about seeing something like Asbury. You want to know why thousands and thousands and thousands of people have come from all over the country and the world to see what's happening there? Because everybody wants the microwaved Holy Spirit experience of like, Lord, come now. It's here. I want it to rub off on me. I want it. I'm not saying that's everybody's motivation. It wasn't mine to go down there, but I wanted to see it and I wanted to bring it back. But then to do the work now, to go, I am not going to let you go, God, until you move. This is where that bottom channel comes in. Because I think so many of us get here and the Lord is about to break through. and We're just like, this is never going to happen. And we just turn around and leave. And this, the, the power and the presence and the spirit of God, like one more whack and it's there. God and his enduring faithfulness says, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Let me show you how I think we can bridge this together. These verses are going to be up on the screen for you because it's out of the message version. I want to read it to you out of that. But before I get there, it seems our society is stuck in this swirling cycle of never-ending ambiguity. People want change. They know they need to change, but they don't know what needs to change. They don't know how to change. And if they figure it out, it seems that we're unwilling to put the work and the effort in required to change. I think it's because of the microwave society we live in. We are so deeply unsatisfied with our lives, but we refuse to stop. If we stopped, it would give way to the anxiety and the worry and the stress that we could actually identify the things that are causing them in our lives. And then when we're forced to stop, what happened? Well, I don't know if you guys remember this, but for a few short months, we were all isolated inside of our houses. You guys remember that? What happened to society then? (laughs) We nearly fell apart. The rise in addiction, in abuse, in suicides, literally rose to levels that we as a society could not handle. In 2021, 47 million people quit their jobs because when they were forced inside, they identified, hey, I hate this job, but I am a slave to the money that it makes me and the lifestyle it produces for me that I'm willing to stay here. And then they said, nope, enough is enough. Now that's created other issues. There are now 10 million open jobs on the market in America right now. People have said, hmm, I don't feel like going back to work. So this has created something of a dynamic. But I think the number one reason that it boiled down to being very unsatisfied and unfulfilled is it caused them much stress, anxiety, and worry. Now I'm going to transition on how followers of Jesus can actually bridge this gap. It has everything to do with freedom. We either embrace it or we wish we could embrace it. But if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, listen to me, you have all of the freedom afforded to you in the form of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness. Do you realize that? By the lack of amens, I'm going to guess you don't realize that. And I'm being serious. This is what I forget. So let's look at Romans 6. 
This is probably the most deep theological understanding of this in Scripture. Now, I love the message because of the way that it writes in our everyday language, okay? So here's how it starts out. So what do we do? Do we keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? This is what it means when I tell you your citizenship has been transferred to heaven, okay? You no longer live for this world. Or didn't you realize that we packed up there and left for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. Church, this is why this is so crucial for you. As you come out of this water, your eyes, as you're raising, are looking towards heaven and they have to stay set there. But as we sit up and then we make eye contact back with the world again, it seems like we get sucked right back in to a place that we no longer live, to a place that no longer holds our citizenship. We're literally foreigners living in a land that we do not belong to, is what he's saying. Look at the next section. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. Amen? Amen. <laughs> A decisive end to that sin, miserable life. No longer captive to sin's demands. Ooh, that's good news. There's your freedom. There's my freedom. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Everybody tracking so far? Look at the next one. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your native tongue, and you hang on every word. You're dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. Isn't that amazing? Look, we're dead to sin and we're alive to God. That's what happened to salvation. This should give us everything we need in this freedom, church. But let's go one more step further. Here's the practical. This means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly, you've been raised from the dead, into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. Amen. Isn't that amazing? But see, church, this creates work for us, doesn't it? Because if we're no longer living in freedom, that means we have given fully back into the life of sin, or at least partially, or at least we're running errands for it. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so what do we do? <laughs> I think we make this far more difficult than it needs to be. I'm going to lay something out for you really simply, okay? If you are in this room and you are a follower of Jesus, here's what he expected of your life. The symbolism of baptism, being buried in his death, being raised to newness of life, he literally gave you a brand new start. He said, your life is now mine. Live the rest of it for me. When you read passages like Romans 6, it says, hey, you're dead to the old way of life. Don't listen to it. It has no authority over you whatsoever. Don't entertain it. Don't mess around with it. Don't run errands for it. Don't do anything for it. Don't let it intrigue you back in to where that is the life you're now living. So we're going to shift, and I'm going to transfer my citizenship 
That's already been done, and I'm now going to live the way that heaven says I should live, which very clearly Jesus boiled down in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Now go, disciple people, teach them all I've observed you, baptizing them in my name, and this is your responsibility the rest of your life. Obviously, there's other things. Church, let's not make this harder than it needs to be. Let's just answer a few questions. You answer them to yourself. Am I a follower of Jesus in this room? You answer that. Don't answer me. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, there was a moment in your life when you said, I can't do this on my own any longer. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. My life is now yours. You've turned your hands over. You've surrendered everything to him. Listen to me. The Bible calls this a death to life experience. There's no gray here. If you say yes to this, you know when you went from death to life. Okay. If you've identified that, real simply, who are you living for? Old citizenship here, new citizenship there. This is not hard to figure out, honestly. Just answer it. (laughs) Okay, now, if you're like, hey, I used to live, I I get it, I got sucked back in, it was terrible, I didn't like it, I was miserable, it caused anxiety, stress, and worry, but thank the Lord I saw this and I am now living fully for the life that Jesus expects me to. Amazing. Look around for somebody that needs that kind of help from you. If you're not, though, Here's what the enemy wants to do. You ready? Yeah. I told you you were worthless, see? So just stay here. Think about this. Don't move on. Lie, lie, lie. Get it out now. You know what Jesus says? Confess it to me. I'll forgive you. Turn around and come back towards me. We're not talking about this anymore. You with me? I need to make sure you hear this. Joel is bringing something up because we're going to practice this at the end of the service. Here's what we do, unfortunately, to the detriment of our lives over and over and over again. We take the sin that Jesus forgave us for and we hold on to it constantly and continually when there's nothing there. Sure, I I can still commit sin. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll forgive you for that. I've already forgiven you for that, but just ask me, I'll forgive you again. But what happens is we take this sin, whatever it is that I struggle with and whatever it is that I'm pretty embarrassed about, I take it and I hold it and wouldn't you like to know what that says? And I put it there and I see it going, but then I'm like, wait, 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 wait. but I still am going to try to dig that out because I don't really believe that that has actually been gone and forgiven. Church, this is where we find ourselves. If this is where you find yourself, we're going to literally give you something to actually do about it today. You can walk away from this today. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to write the things that plague my life that I feel like God can't use me for, and I'm going to write them on a piece of paper, and I'm going to drop them in that water. And as I walk away from this, it is going to be my act of repentance that that is where that's going to stay. And as I walk away, I am engaging to do the work that the Holy Spirit would move, and we would see revival here in our city. Now, I'm going to ask you to come for whatever reason the Lord is moving you to. If that's your reason, God, I want to see you move. And I know I have to get less of me in order to do that than come up and do the same thing. For some of you, you just need to experience the freedom that Jesus gave you in your salvation. Come write it and put it in. For some of you, this is the first time you are hearing you have freedom in Jesus and you need to come experience it. 
And for some of you, you're not a follower of Jesus in this room. And today can be the day that you truly experience freedom for the very first time. Our prayer team is going to be up here in front. You can come and you can grab this and you can go kneel down. You can use those benches over there, go back to your seat, do whatever you need to do. But our prayer team is here and ready to pray with you. Our response to God comes where he's wanted is to live in the freedom that he gave us. And then we can build from there. But we have to take this step first. As the band comes up, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to just do some business with God. Here's how we're going to close our service. We rush everything in our lives, it seems. We probably have things to get to after this. We probably have appointments. We probably have things we need to get done. You know what? If that's something you had scheduled prior to this, okay, you can go. You can do whatever you need to do. But maybe if the Lord is saying to you, you know what? Hey, why don't you stay? Why don't you stay as long as this takes in order for me to do a work in your life? Then I'm just going to ask you to stay. We're not keeping you here off time. We're not, we're not keeping you here at all. This is just asking you to do business with the Holy Spirit. I have things to do before our family meeting tonight. And if I stay here until our family meeting starts, I'm okay with that. This is way more important. Church, we cannot microwave our relationship with Jesus. It takes time. It takes investment. It takes surrender. And Psalm 37 says it takes waiting patiently on the Lord until he moves. I know I called our band up here, but I feel like they get gypped out of this quite a bit. And so if they want to participate in this, we're just going to play a song. They don't have to play this live. It's up to them. But Father, I pray that right now you would just direct our hearts deeply back to you. Holy Spirit, I, fall, I, I pray that you fall individually on us, collectively as a body. We long to see the kind of things that we read about. For the people in this room that are not yet following you, Jesus, I pray that their heart is turning inside of their chest so much that they cannot wait to talk to one of our prayer people. I pray that for the followers of you in this room that have got to desperately get up here, write something down and let the bondage of sin go. Father, that they run even now. Father, we trust you for these things. We love you and we're just asking you to move in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys come and be a part of this. Come up and pray with our team. Do whatever you feel like the Holy Spirit is moving you to do. Go ahead and stand. People standing around this baptism are, are part of Layton's community. And this is what this is supposed to look like. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. So it's going to be pretty loud up here because these guys are going to go crazy. So we didn't practice last time, so we're going to practice in case you guys forgot. It's been like two weeks since we had a baptism, all right? So in heaven, as they watch what happens on earth, every time somebody surrenders from death to life, there is a party in heaven. And I would imagine with the billions of people there, it's pretty darn loud. So we're going to try to outdo them. So we're going to pretend as she just goes under the water and comes out on the count of three, you guys are going to live it up and hoot and holler and yell. You ready? One, two, three. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's get Leighton in the tub. Hey, her dad has the privilege of baptizing her for one, because him and his wife, Sally Leighton's mom, have been incredibly godly people, and they have shown her Jesus. That is amazing. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to try not to cry, but no promises. All right. 
I didn't start reading yet. <sighs> okay. I, you, you can read. I don't know why I'm going to do better. <laughs> Jason has no emotions. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but he's part of the community, but seriously. All right. So Leighton's testimony. I have always seen God in my life, but as a younger kid, it was more, I knew my parents believed in him, so I should just do what they say. I went to church, sang and worship, and did the things a Christian is expected to do. In 2019, my dad was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. I went to bed every night, not knowing whether or not I was going to see him the next morning. I prayed to see him every day, and God kept pushing me to not give up, even when I didn't know it. God came in my life and has always been there. I just didn't notice. I want to give up my life to God so that I can keep pushing forward. I can always know that when I can no longer do it, I can give it up to him. For me, giving your life to God doesn't mean that you simply know he's there. It's that you are able to give everything you have and everything that you're holding on to to him, knowing that he has something bigger, better, and forever lasting in store for me. God knows the hardest times that I've been through, and he knows what's coming. But he is now and always will be by my side to help me through. Woo. That is written from an 11-year-old. Not unreal. I want you guys to take notice of the kids that are up here because these are our leaders that we are pouring into starting literally right now to train them for leadership, and Leighton is going to be one of those leaders that we're super excited for. Um, so the year before that, in 2018, um, right after we had adopted Leighton's older sisters, we had the chance to take them all to New York City for um, the first time. And one of the things, we had a, a gift card to Starbucks, um, and all six of us went to Starbucks, and which was a big deal because when you're taking six people to Starbucks, especially teenagers that add a whole bunch of extra stuff, like that gets super expensive. So we didn't get to do it very often. But it's a cold kind of rainy day in New York City. And we come out of the Starbucks and they're all excited about having their drinks and we're heading off to the next tourist stop that we were going to go to. And as we're moving forward, Sally and I look around and Leighton's gone. Like great feeling anytime even better feeling in a city like New York <laughs> when you look around and your child's not there. And so we're frantically looking around and we look back and just across the stuff from the Starbucks was a homeless guy that was kind of wrapped up in tarps and things sitting up against the railing. And as we look back and we find Leighton, we watch her move directly from the store that we just came out of with her warm drink and walk up to this homeless man wrapped in his blankets and just say, I want you to have this, and hands it to them. And, the, and then we see, and we, she comes over with us, and we round the corner. And at that point, like, the tears start flowing because she really, really wanted that drink. But she saw someone else who needed it more, which I think has really been how Leighton has always moved through this world, is that she sees the world through kingdom eyes. And there's always opportunities to, to love, there's always opportunities to show peace, to show kindness, to care for each other, completely selflessly. And it's a good reminder for me through the last couple of years, through a time where I have really become jaded and just found myself going through the motions a lot of time, that, that her faith has carried my faith and, it, and it's brought me back closer in touch with my Savior and my first love through seeing her so selflessly and willingly just dive right into it. And so, Leighton, I have a couple of questions that I need to ask you. Do you believe that Jesus is your Savior and that he died on the cross to save you from your sins and rose again so that you could join him in heaven someday? Yes. Then based on that confession, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as well.
All right. Come and welcome your new sister to the faith. Love you all. See you next week. See you tonight. <laughs>